tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. <laughs> Good evening. I'm storyteller Otis Gyre, and I ain't your grandfather. From where I'm from, we don't do bedtime stories. And if that's what you were expecting, you're in the wrong place. If it's terrifying tales you're after, well then. I've got just the thing. Get comfortable. Settle in. Turn off the lights, if you dare. Your night is about to get a whole lot darker. <laughs> Who needs sleep anyway? <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, you're listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark. Welcome to Season 5, Episode 13. I'm your host, Otis Jiry. In tonight's episode, I'll be performing four stories for you about malevolent museums, horrific homes, nightmarish neighbors, and evil elements. You're listening to the standard edition of tonight's program, which contains the first two terrifying tales. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy an extended version of this and other episodes with twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today. And thank you for your support. Now, it's time to take a walk together down the moonlit trail. So lock your doors, turn your lights down low, and settle in. The show is about to begin. <laughs> Our first tale tonight comes to us from author James Colton. In it, we'll visit a museum with an interesting exhibit. The remains of a mysterious woman which were found buried beneath a dilapidated shack in the nearby woods, and which have spawned numerous legends, the most pernicious of all being that the corpse reanimates. Is there any truth to the old wives' tales? Stick around and find out. Without further ado, I present to you the blink of an eye. Henry never believed the stories, a marketing trick. That's all they were, meant to lure tourists who wanted to be fooled. That's what he told the curator in so many words during his job interview. The curator gave Henry a tour of the museum just after closing on Friday night, and introduced him to Martha Carnwood. She was a local legend, found buried under the foundation of a ruined cottage deep in the Carnhill Woods. A few other sets of remains had been found, but Martha was the only one who hadn't rotted down to the bones. The rumors began almost as soon as she was put on public display in the museum. Henry believed it was just a self-fulfilling prophecy. If everyone expected her to blink, then amidst all the jostling and camera flashes, someone was sure to imagine they saw her blink. As for the blurry photographic evidence that circulated on the Internet, those were just shadows cast at unnatural angles or reflections off her glass case. Aspiring ghost hunters had been duped by less. The curator seemed encouraged by Henry's skepticism. It indicated a level head and strong nerves, and Henry was appointed to the post of night guard. He started his first shift the following Monday. Henry didn't visit Martha often that first night. Not that he was scared, he didn't believe the stories. But walking past the corpse in the dark would unnerve anyone. During his tour the previous week, 
Henry had thought she looked like an old paper bag, stained, stuffed, and dressed, with facial features crudely cut as if by a child. Her eyes, of course, were closed. Fortunately, Martha was tucked in a dead-end corridor at the back of the museum. There was a service door at the far end, but it was kept locked after hours, so would-be trespassers couldn't use it. Henry could stroll along the adjoining passage, glance down Martha's Hall if he felt so inclined, and generally pretend she didn't exist. But sometime around 3 a.m., as he was patrolling near Martha's corridor, Henry thought he heard the service door click shut. He pointed his flashlight toward the end of the hall and saw nothing, but something must have made the noise. Henry strolled down the hall, passing Martha Conwood, and checked the service door to confirm that it was still locked. It was. Maybe somebody was hiding. A supernatural thrill-seeker, hoping to catch a private performance from Martha. Henry swung his flashlight around to search for the intruder. The beam passed over Martha's display case, and Henry's heart jumped. For a moment, he thought, no, nah, it was just a glare of the, his flashlight off the glass. Henry wasn't superstitious. He didn't believe the rumors. There were very few places for an intruder to hide. Henry checked them all before deciding the sound uh, must have been the heating system shutting off. He was about to leave when his flashlight once more passed across Martha's case. Henry froze. He wanted to move his flashlight, wanted to look away, but Martha held his gaze. Her eyes were closed, as always, and her gash of a mouth spread across her face in a serene smile, frozen. It wasn't right. A human body shouldn't be so still. A statue of marble could get away with it, but not this with its papery skin and intelligent expression, and those fingers poking out from frilled sleeves and curling gently against her unmoving chest. Perfectly formed fingers, like a doll's, only brown and with nails that were yellow and jagged. Henry tried to focus on those ruined nails and abhorrently perfect fingers, until he could remove his gaze entirely, he would look at nothing else, especially not that face, that smiling, lipless mouth, that collapsed nose, those... Henry choked and stumbled back. No, it was nothing. He'd been staring at her fingers. He hadn't been looking properly at her face. It was a trick of the poor light, the fancy of a nervous mind, glimpsed, no, imagined, out of the corner of his eyes. Her eyes hadn't, couldn't. Henry turned and forced himself not to run from the corridor. He maintained a steady gait and didn't stop until Martha's passage was out of sight. Didn't stop until he was in the Carn Hill Wildlife Exhibit, surrounded by stuffed birds and foxes and mice. Dead things still, but friendlier creatures. These didn't mock mankind's mortality. At worst, they only looked comically out of place, perhaps wearing a bewildered expression of, Wait a moment. This isn't right. I shouldn't be here. Henry allowed the presence of the animals to calm him. These taxidermies were nothing horrible, and that's all Martha Carnwood was, after all, a natural taxidermy. She just seemed worse because she was human and poorly preserved compared with these well-posed creatures of fur and feathers. Henry, you're being ridiculous, he thought. Martha was just a body, an empty body. She couldn't move, couldn't blink. Henry knew this. He was a sensible man, not afraid of spooky legends. Yet, as he turned back in the direction of Martha's corridor... His skin prickled. His eyelids, like flaps of torn paper, slowly parting to reveal black emptiness. Stop it! Henry completed his patrol 
making sure to give Martha's back corner a wide berth. He came to the main lobby and paused by the front doors. The street outside was dark and empty. The world was asleep. Only Henry was up and about, disturbing the air during this supreme hour of silence. Henry pushed in the doors to make sure they were locked. They rattled and echoed through the vast halls of the museum. The sound penetrated the farthest reaches and returned to Henry's ears like distant footsteps. He was very glad that Martha Carnwood was trapped in her case and couldn't get up and walk about. None of that, he thought, reminding himself that he wasn't a superstitious fellow. He hesitated a moment more before the doors. He could see his reflection in the glass. He could see the vague, transparent forms of the lobby behind him. He could, just barely, see the dark openings of passages that led to the various exhibits. And a shadow glided out of sight around a corner. Henry spun and cast his light around the lobby. Who's there? he called. No one answered. Henry stood and listened. All quiet. But someone is here, he thought. He marched down the nearest corridor, the one he thought the shadow had vanished through. He passed rows of old farming tools and yellow documents. He rounded a corner and passed a diorama of the village of Carn Hill, filled with tiny, old-fashioned people going about menial tasks. He rounded another corner and found himself staring down at a dead end, at a single glass case containing a still dark form. In her bed as I left her, thought Henry, and he turned away quickly before his imagination could run wild. And imagination was all it was, of course. The figure he'd seen in the lobby doors, imagination. Or perhaps a bird flying outside, its shadowy passages interfering with the reflections warped by a nervous mind into the shape of a woman stepping through the darkness. And yet, as Henry returned to the security office for a cup of coffee, he couldn't shake the impression of footsteps following behind him. He refused to look, insisting, yeah, it's just my own echo. He passed once more through the wildlife exhibit and its wildly staring animals. This time they brought him a little comfort. Their eyes seemed to him black and empty, and he wished they would close and stay closed until the sun came up. At the office, he filled his mug to the brim. I must be sleep-deprived, he thought. Maybe the caffeine would set his senses straight. He sat in a chair and drank his coffee, then poured himself a second cup. As he drank... Henry found himself thinking of the story the curator had told him, of the skeletons that had been dug up around Martha. Why had their flesh rotted away while Martha remained intact? What exactly had the archaeologists unearthed in those deep woods? He imagined their surprise when they first uncovered Martha's serene brown face. Had she blinked at them? He could imagine it far too well, those eyelids drawing back like tattered paper curtains and revealing an abysmal darkness. Henry could see it, feel himself falling into it. He sat up with a start. Something crashed and shattered. He looked down and saw his coffee mug and pieces on the floor. Then he looked up at the office door and, without thinking why, hurried over to lock it. There he paused, leaning his weight against the door, he slowly put his ear to its cool surface and listened. A faint shuffling sound, a scuffing step. Henry held his breath. He felt glued to the door, and his joints were fused like welded iron. Something touched the other side, a gentle, papery sound, like a hand stroking back and forth. It slid toward the doorknob, then stopped. Henry could hear his heart pounding against his ribs. Icy sweat oozed across his forehead. Something clicked against the other side, 
then scraped across to where Henry held his ear against the door, and there it sounded a single tap. Henry threw himself back and collapsed in the chair. He stared at the door with eyes that felt like they were about to fall into his lap. The tapping became a furious scratching, then suddenly it stopped. Henry panted in his chair, unable to move, unable to blink. The silence in the office grew until Henry could feel it pressing against his skull. He could feel it spreading throughout the museum, the vast, empty museum that Henry alone occupied. There was no one else but those sounds. Henry sat there for nearly an hour before thinking to himself, I need a check. He'd been hired to patrol the corridors and guard against intruders. An intruder was all it was, an intruder who was very good at hiding himself, an intruder that delighted in playing pranks on night guards. Well, Henry wouldn't be pranked. He made himself get out of the chair and walked to the door. He unlocked it, cracked it open, and peered outside. Police were called to the museum early Tuesday morning. There was no sign of a break-in, and none of the exhibits had been tampered with. The only oddities they found were a broken coffee mug in the security office and a pile of bones in a dead-end corridor toward the back of the museum, where the corpse of Martha Conwood smiled at those who came to see her blink. I hope you enjoyed The Blink of an Eye by author James Colton, as performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed what you've heard and would like to hear more from the author, do yourself a favor and pick up a copy of James' latest anthology of ghost stories, plus one written by his wife Shannon, entitled Pages of Dust, Volume 4. As James describes the latest in his line of collections of spooky tales, in the dust corners of reality, where the darkness refuses to be banished, nightmares lurk. They wait for the curious and unfortunate to stumble out of the well-lit paths of life. Beware, for in opening this book, you part the veil and slip into the realm of the dead. The book is available in both Kindle and paperback editions, and is now available on Amazon.com. Just search for Pages of Dust, Volume 4, or visit simplyscarypodcast.com slash dust4. That's simplyscarypodcast.com slash D-U-S-T and the number 4. Thank you for your support of the author and of indie horror fiction. Up next, we've got another terrifying tale for you, this one from author Brian Martinez. In it, we'll meet Warren the not-so-proud owner of what he was told was a fixer-upper. And as if the constant need for repairs wasn't enough, now he started hearing strange sounds coming from the lower level. Will he determine their source or discover he's lost his mind? Stay tuned and find out. Without further ado, I present to you The Basement Stairs. Warren hated that old house. It was coming up on two years since he'd bought it. Everything in it creaked and leaked, from the basement to the roof and everything between. It had bare wooden floors that warped and leaned at crooked angles, bathrooms wallpapered in heavy mildew and old cigarette smoke, lights that blinked whenever he walked down the hallway. And it was cold. Real cold. Starting in the first months of fall, all the way through the dead of winter, the house was filled with a dampness that cut to the bone. Wind whistled through the old window frames, no matter how much he tried to block them up with blankets. Even when he could manage to stop a draft from coming in through one window, another would just take its place. The whistling unnerved Warren like distant crying in the woods. He woke up shivering sometimes from the cold air pressing down on his chest. 
and started wearing thick socks and shoes around the house most of the time just to keep the feeling in his toes. The real estate agent had called it a fixer-upper, but that was just a nice way of saying it was a money pit, a place where dreams went to slowly die. And then there was the sound. It didn't happen every night, but sometimes, just after 6.30, after he'd eaten whatever he picked up for dinner, it would start. Warren would be on the couch trying to watch the news when it would start somewhere deep down in the basement. Kathump, kathump, kathump. It was a thick sound, like footsteps, but heavier. And the basement door, which he always kept closed, was between the living room and the kitchen, where he rarely went. As he sat watching television, he would hear it move slowly up the basement stairs, one agonizing step at a time. Kathump, kathump, kathump. For an entire year, he'd been trying to ignore it, pretend it didn't exist. But each day, the sound grew harder to block out. Tonight, as he tried to watch a movie for a change, he was just getting comfortable thinking that perhaps he'd been left alone for the night, when the familiar sound started at the bottom of the basement stairs. Kathump, kathump, kathump. Moving slowly, climbing stairs one at a time, Warren turned up the volume and leaned in closer to the television, straining to hear the movie he could already barely follow, but the sound only seemed to grow louder. It was a hammer on his skull. He closed his eyes and counted to ten, praying it would go away, but each count was accompanied by the sound echoing up from the basement, like the heartbeat in his own chest. Kathump, kathump, kathump. It mocked him, teased him, attacked him, until he thought for the thousandth time about moving out. But he had no money left after what the house had eaten up, and he had his pride to think about as well. What would the neighbors think of him if he packed up, tucked his tail, and ran off in the night? What would they say about him when he was gone? Still, the sound came through the basement door. Kathump! Thump, thump. When he couldn't take it any more, Warren turned off the television, jumped up from the couch, and turned to face the basement. Stop it! He shouted, his voice echoing off bare walls and a sagging ceiling. Just stop! He knew the sound wasn't real. It couldn't be. There was nothing down there but a long set of wooden stairs ending in a hard concrete floor. If anyone could see him now, yelling at the air, they would think he was crazy. But Warren lived alone these days, and no one was there to think anything about him. He glared at the unpainted basement door, drawing up his strength, willing it to be silent. But still, it came louder and louder, slowly rising up the stairs. Kathump! 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 A laugh bubbled up in his throat. He was being ridiculous, of course. Scared of a door. He walked to it, still not believing, still not letting the possibility of it into his head. Step by step, foot by foot, he crossed the living room, feet dragging slightly on the warped floor until he reached the basement door. Kathump! 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 With the breath caught in his throat like a fish, Warren stared at the unpainted door. It hadn't been opened in a year. Even through all those nights of listening to the sound move up the stairs again and again, of holding his pillow over his ears, and praying for sleep. He'd refused to entertain the idea. But 
It was time that changed. This twisted game had gone on long enough. He had to end it while he still had one last nerve left to do it with. Tonight was the night Warren took his house back. But then he noticed something. In the minute he'd been standing in front of the door, willing his hand to reach up and touch the handle, the sound from the basement had stopped except for the house's frame creaking under the wind outside, the night was silent. Warren reached up, his heart booming in his chest like a man trying to escape his jail cell, and slowly touched the handle. It was cold and solid, real. He almost laughed again. The idea that he'd been expecting anything else was ridiculous, that he thought his hand might pass through it like a hook through a jellyfish. With a deep breath, he turned the handle and slowly, very slowly, opened the door, the long creak of an unoiled hinge overtaking the throbbing in his ears. The darkness at the basement seeped through a crack between the door and the frame. One sliver at a time, the basement stairs he hadn't seen in a year were revealed to him. That long path beneath the ground, old, uneven slats of wood dipping down into a pool of black thicker than paint. Kathump, kathump, kathump. The sound suddenly rose up the basement stairs faster than ever before. It came at him, expected to see him, as if it was about to crash through the door and leap out at him. Warren slammed the door shut and ran, ran to the front of the house ready to escape into the night and never come back so long as he lived. His body was electric. His heart felt like it was clawing its way up his neck so it could crawl out of his mouth. He'd never been so terrified in his life, never so sure of the danger that came for him. With his hand on the front door, he stopped. It took a moment to think about what he was doing. Where would he go? What would he say when he got there? With nothing but a crazy story in his pocket, who would take him in? Who would even believe what he had to say? Knock, knock, knock. The door came alive under his hand. He stumbled back, almost falling. Warren stared at the front door, horrified that he had not won, but two doors to be scared of. But even in his panic, he knew something about the knocking on the door was different. It was a normal sound, nothing like the one he'd lived with for the past year. With shaking hands, he approached the front door again, close enough to put his eye to the peephole. A worried face and red hair. He sighed. It was the neighbor next door, the young woman who liked to garden, she lived on her own, he remembered. Something about her parents leaving her the house. She looked like she was unsure of being on his doorstep, her body language saying she was about to leave. Warren considered staying quiet and letting her go, but something in him needed to speak to someone, anyone, even a woman he'd barely said a dozen words to in two years. He opened the door. She looked back at him with concerned eyes, waiting for him to say something. But he didn't know what to say. What could he say? Uh, hello, he managed. Sorry to knock on your door so late, she said. But are you all right? I thought I heard someone shouting. He stared at her a moment. Oh, he finally said. He thought of his outburst a few minutes earlier, yelling at a door. He was embarrassed to think anyone had heard that. I, I was just watching a movie. I probably, I probably had the volume too high. He motioned to the living room. She glanced over the living room, visible from the front door, and saw the television turned off. I was, he added. To be fair, it was true, just not what she'd actually heard. 
Her face relaxed. I'm really sorry. I shouldn't have interrupted. No, I'm glad you did, he replied. It was the most honest thing Warren had said in a long time. She smiled, and for a second he forgot all about the sound in the basement. What was it? she asked. He blinked. What? The movie. Oh, he glanced sideways. You know, I already forgot. She put her hand to mouth and laughed. The friendly sound of it brightened his doorstep and the night beyond. Was this what it was like to be normal? It had been so long since he'd spoken with someone, he'd forgotten what it felt like to talk to a person, to make them laugh. Doesn't sound like a very good movie, she said. No, I guess not. She nodded, brushing her hair over her ear. Well, as long as you're okay, I overreact sometimes. But honestly, I'd hate myself if I didn't do something and someone ended up hurt. I hear about this stuff all the time. No problem at all. I was glad someone was looking out for me. She smiled, saying goodnight and apologizing once again for the intrusion. Before she left, she turned back to Warren, looking a bit unsure of what she was about to say. Listen, I know you haven't gone out much since, uh, you know. She shifted uncomfortably, as she did. If you ever need an ear, I'm right next door. I know how lonely it gets in these big houses. It does, I guess, Warren said. Not knowing what else to say, he added, Thank you. No problem. She paused again. I never talked to her, but she seemed nice. She smiled sheepishly, then gave a small nod and headed back to her house. Warren watched her go, then closed the door and locked it. It was coming up on two years since he and Mary Lynn bought the house. Mary Lynn, with her black hair like a raven's feathers, had been as nice as the red-haired neighbor when they first met, but the house had changed her. It changed both of them. Their fixer-upper consumed them until it was all they could talk about, all they fought about. When he thought of their last argument, his face still went red at the memory. That day he'd seen a side of both of them that still shook them. The basement had fallen silent since he'd left. He went to it, feeling the deep embarrassment of a man who'd woken up from a screaming nightmare he'd sworn was real while he was in it. It was a completely normal, unpainted door, and he had to face the fact that what he'd been hearing, what he had been experiencing in the last year, was the result of a man unprepared to move on. He opened the door, not slowly this time, not with the reverence of fear, but like he would any other door. The squeak of its dry brass hinges was brief, like the tiny yelp of a surprised mouse. Without flinching, Warren forced himself to look directly at the basement stairs to see them for what they were, earthly things of wood and nails, and nothing more. As he looked down at the stairs, Warren felt a chill run through him. It started on his back, a cold spot like someone had pressed an ice cube to his spine, and it moved through his blood like a shadow over open ground. The tiny hairs at the back of his neck stood up as he felt the unmistakable presence of someone standing behind him, just over his shoulder. His nose picked up the hint of a familiar perfume, and yet he didn't turn around, didn't dare to, didn't dare look. As he stood there frozen in fear, Warren's mind drifted to that day more than a year earlier. Can you please paint this today? Mary Lynn stood in front of the basement door, her small hands on her waist. Please! Warren put down the black garbage bag he was carrying, stuffed to the gills with broken glass, moth-eaten pillowcases, and old wires he'd pulled out of the spare bedroom, the one they'd never quite gotten to. All oh, houses falling apart. Why are you so obsessed with one door? 
because it creeps me out. And painting it will change that? She frowned at him. We won't find out unless we try. He wiped the dusty sweat from his brow with his forearm, leaving the garbage bag behind. You can paint it too, you know. Maybe I would if I wasn't busy cooking dinner. I didn't ask you to cook dinner. Well, I don't see you doing it. That's right, because I'm not doing anything at all, right? It went on like that for almost an hour. The two of them argued louder and louder, forgetting all about the dinner burning on the stove, an expensive piece of fish gone black. They'd fought so many times already, but this time was different. This time the fight grew bitter and petty. Warren and Mary Lynn, standing in front of the basement door, screamed at each other about every dripping faucet and rusty nail in the house, all because he hadn't gotten around to painting one door. They came to the point where Warren was flinging the basement door open, shouting that he would just take it off the hinges and remove it if it bothered her so much. Each time he did, Mary Lynn slammed it shut, screaming all kinds of nasty things at him, things he never thought he'd hear from the lips of the sweet girl he'd married. And then, in the heat of the moment... He did something he'd never done before. He grabbed her arm. She looked up at him, shocked by his behavior. Before she could pull away, he wrenched her over in front of the open door so she could look at the stupid basement stairs for herself. When she had a good hard look at them, he leaned in close to her ear so she didn't miss a word. You so scared of the basement? He hissed. Look at it. He didn't recognize his own voice coming out of him. It didn't even feel like him saying it. But before he could stop himself, before the little voice in the back of his mind could ask him what he was doing, Warren gave Mary Lynn a hard shove toward the stairs that bothered her so much. Warren shook, unable to move. Pressure overcame him, and his eardrums felt about to pop. Whatever it was behind him, whoever it was, he could feel the hatred coming off them in waves, pulsing like blacktop in summer. Unseen lips drew closer, close enough they could kiss him. With cold breath drifting across his neck, the shadow behind him whispered into his ear, Look at it and then he felt it on his back. A single push. Warren tipped over the precipice of the basement door. Either the fear or something else kept his arms from working, but kept his hands from stopping the fall. His head was the first to hit the basement stairs. He heard a loud crack as his neck bent sideways, and a deep, sharp pain shot through his body followed by a messy tumble down the stairs. He felt every broken arm, every dislocated leg as he flopped and rolled down the long set of steps, ending in a hard stop on cold concrete. Warren couldn't move his legs. His body was shattered, his breath shallow. His eyes rolled in his skull to look back up the distance he'd fallen, up the stairs that looked a mile long from where he lay all the way to the basement door. It was coming up on two years since he and Mary Lynn bought the house, and one year since she'd died. Yet there she stood, black hair like a raven's feathers, blowing softly in the draft that never left. She was pale and beautiful and cold, her eyes diamond-cut from pressure and pain. Please... Warren whispered. It was all he could manage to pull from weakened lungs. With a light touch of her small hand, she closed the still unpainted door. The dry hinge creaked like a dead tree in the winter wind. Then all light cut out, plunging both Warren and the basement into pure darkness. 
The black encompassed him, surrounded him, drawing the precious heat from his shattered body. Finally, the old house, the house he hated so much, was finishing the job of bleeding him dry. He could no longer feel his feet, or really much else beyond the slowing of his own heart. Gasping like a fish, Warren summoned whatever he had left and focused on reaching the stairs. They were somewhere in front of him, in the dark. By some miracle, he got his arms to work, and he began pulling himself along the frigid basement floor, useless legs dragging behind him. Barely able to lift his head, he clutched the bottom step and pulled himself up it. The strain on his broken neck was too much to hold. His head slumped, pounding against the wood. Yet still, he didn't stop. He couldn't. Not until he reached the top. Maybe there he could call for help loud enough that someone would hear him. Maybe the nice neighbor with the red hair. There wasn't anyone else close enough to hear. No one else who cared. One step at a time, he dragged his cold body up the stairs and toward the door, hoping to be saved, praying to be forgiven. And one step at a time, his heavy head fell and struck the wood. A thick sound, like footsteps, but heavier. Kathump, kathump, kathump. I hope you enjoyed The Basement Stairs by author Brian Martinez, as performed by yours truly. I'd like to personally thank you for joining me for this episode of Scary Stories Told in the Dark. If you've enjoyed what you've heard, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts. And leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to us. If you'd like to hear a premium, extended edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes featuring twice the terror, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at chillingtalesfordarknights.com where you can purchase a season's pass for this podcast and our other quality storytelling programs. Or become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, all of it ad-free. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You can subscribe to me on YouTube as well, at the Otis Gyrie channel, where you'll find releases of my series Horror Storytime dating back to 2014. And you can find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, too. Just search for Otis Gyrie. Until next week, stay spooky and get some sleep if you can. <laughs> Thanks for listening. You've been listening to Scary Stories Told in the Dark, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcasts Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Otis Jiry. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Luke Hodgkinson and Jesse Cornett. Sound design and final mixing and mastering provided by executive producer and director Craig Groshek. Program's artwork and logo by David Romero. If you're looking for some fresh tales on a daily basis while waiting for the next podcast, check out my YouTube channel, The Otis Jiry Channel, and my extensive collection of narrated tales there. Simply search on YouTube by my name, and you'll find me. And don't forget to subscribe and press the bell notification icon to get my latest releases. Got a scary tale of your own that you'd like performed? I take submissions. Email it to me today at 
Otis at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your terrifying tome considered for production in a future episode of this show. That's O-T-I-S at simplyscarypodcast.com. If you've enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on Facebook to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and other programs and my channel. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for CTFDN as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every Wednesday. And don't forget to hit that thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word or a request. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next Wednesday with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. But that's all right. Who needs sleep anyway? Ha 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 ha!